Baldwood presents Murder in Florence, written by T.A. Williams and read by Simon Mattox. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Baldwood. Prologue. Monday night. One of the first things I quickly learned about being a private investigator is that it isn't all beautiful heiresses, diamond necklaces and bottles of bourbon. In my limited experience, in the first three months of my new career here in Florence as Dan Armstrong private investigator, beautiful heiresses had been sadly lacking, and a motley selection of unfaithful spouses, pilfering home helps, nasty neighbours and missing persons had predominated. My most exciting case so far had been a senior member of the Florentine City Council, caught in flagrante with a councillor from the opposition party behind an immaculately pruned and particularly dense bush in the Bobbly Gardens. That had been back in August when the sun had been shining, so brightly in fact that I feared that the couple in question might have ended up with uncomfortable sunburn. Today had certainly not been sunburn weather. There's rain and there's Tuscan rain. When it rains over here, it rarely wastes time with drizzle or light showers. It just goes for it. It suddenly becomes easy to see how the River Arno was able to flood so much of Florence back in 1966 and destroy so many priceless works of art. Tonight, the city wasn't going to be flooded, but my dog and I were drenched. I pulled up the collar of my raincoat and glanced down at Oscar. Even he, the dog who lives for splashing about in water, was looking bedraggled. He and I had been wandering through the side streets of the suburbs of Florence for several hours now. This was an unprepossessing area, packed with 1960s apartment blocks in varying states of disrepair, and, on a night like this, totally lacking in any charm whatsoever. We had been circling one particular block containing a far-from-glamorous two-star hotel, and we had been getting wetter and wetter. Ostensibly, just a man walking his dog, I had been keeping an eye on a silver BMW, belonging to Osvaldo Dante, a wealthy industrialist and owner of OD Textiles, a factory in the neighbouring town of Prato. He would parked the car outside the rear entrance by the bins, and, if it hadn't been for the rain keeping the bad boys indoors, I would have been seriously worried for him that he might return to find the car on bricks and his wheels missing. It was that kind of place. As I had quickly worked out since starting my new venture as a private investigator, Florence doesn't just consist of the world heritage Centro Storico, with its buildings of breathtaking antiquity and beauty. Like all cities, it has its less salubrious underbelly. And that was where Oscar and I now found ourselves, and like I say, it was seriously wet. And for somebody used to English weather, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to rain. It was miserable. However, I felt sure the inclement weather didn't bother Signor Dante in the slightest. The reason he'd chosen to come here was to be with the glamorous Giuseppina Napolitano, his secretary and alleged mistress. The person making the allegations, and paying me to be here splashing about looking for proof, was Signora Antonia Dante, his wife. This formidable lady had marched into my office a couple of days earlier, dolled up to the nines and dripping with gold jewellery, to tell me she'd finally had enough of her husband's philandering and wanted me to provide evidence of his infidelity. I had done a bit of digging and, as a result, had photographed him arriving at the hotel tonight with none other than Ms. Napolitano. From the way he'd been groping his secretary as they'd hurried into the hotel, I seriously doubted that this could be considered a work meeting. So far, I had managed to get photos of their arrival together and a partial shot of the alluring Giuseppina standing entwined with her boss by the window of their room on the second floor. Alas, she had lowered the blinds shortly afterwards, so Oscar and I had been hanging about in the hope of a passionate departure scene I could photograph with my very expensive and heavy new camera that I was desperately trying to keep dry. This thing had a telephoto lens that could not only pick out the face of a man standing a hundred metres away, but could probably also identify the brand of cigarette he was smoking. Although, on a night like tonight, the cigarette would soon have been extinguished by the rain. After doing another circuit of the building, my soggy Labrador and I returned to my ageing VW minibus and opened the tailgate. Oscar needed no encouraging to jump in. Unfortunately, if unsurprisingly, he then set about shaking himself violently, 
transforming the inside of the boot area into a swamp. And that wasn't much better. As I slid into the driving seat, I could feel the water running off my raincoat and soaking into the seat covers. My hair was drenched, and the water had run past my collar and down my back as far as my pants. Not for the first time, I envied the sleuths of the black-and-white crime noir movies their broad-brimmed hats. I'm sure Philip Marlowe never had water soaking his underpants. I reached for my all-important bag and felt around inside it, not for a Colt 45, a shot of bourbon or a cigar, but for a thermos of coffee and a packet of biscuits. I lobbed a biscuit back to Oscar and poured myself a welcome cup of coffee. I was sipping it, my eyes skipping between the window of their room and the back door of the hotel, when my phone started ringing. It was Virgilio. Since making the big decision to move from London to Italy and settle here in Tuscany, I had struck up a close friendship with Inspector Virgilio Pisano of the Florence Murder Squad. He was, in so many ways, what I used to be. Until my 55th birthday last year, I had been a detective chief inspector in the Metropolitan Police in central London. Although he knew I was retired, Virgilio called me in from time to time to help out with investigations here when English speakers were involved. I glanced at the time and saw that it was just after 10pm. It came as no surprise to find that he was still in the office. Ciao, Dan. Come stai? Although his English was good, we always spoke Italian together, and I answered in Italian. Ciao, Virgilio. I'm fine. What about you? Still working? I'm just on my way home. I thought I'd give you a call to tell you I've sent a bit of business your way. That's good of you. What kind of business? Not another extramarital affair. Haven't you Florentines got anything else to do with your time? You've seen the quality of the TV here. What else is there to do? He hastened to qualify his statement. Not that I have the time or energy even to contemplate infidelity. He and his wife, Lena, had been together for almost thirty years, and it was one of the happiest marriages I knew. I envied him that. Mine hadn't survived the test of time, or, more precisely, the constraints of my job. Well, what have you got for me this time? He'd been sending me clients on and off over the past few months, ever since I'd taken his advice and set myself up as a private investigator. Does the name uh, Selina Gardner ring a bell? Selina Gardner? You mean the film star? The very same. She's here in Florence, making a movie for a few weeks. This was big. Selina Gardner was one of the top five, maybe top two or three movie stars in the world. Her face and body known to millions of people around the globe. Even I had heard of her succession of three, or was it four, short-lived marriages and divorces. The streets of Hollywood were allegedly strewn with the men she had cast off, and the scandal sheets would have been half as thick without her. So how come a humble detective inspector is involved with movie royalty? I'd better explain. They've been getting death threats. I've never met Selina Gardner, but uh, I've had a couple of visits from one of the producers of the film. I could hear a note of something in his voice, and I struggled to identify it. Amusement, maybe? She came to Oscar the police to provide protection for Miss Gardner and the rest of the crew, but she couldn't tell me who they're afraid of, who in particular is being threatened, why they're being threatened, or where and when these threats are supposed to be carried out. What form do these threats take? Poison pen letters? Social media trolling? Abusive phone calls? Burning bags of dog poo on the doorstep? Threatening notes. But they're always delivered attached to an arrow. An arrow? This was a new one on me. You mean somebody fires arrows at them with a bow, like in the westerns? Why on earth? Not so much westerns as medieval dramas. The movie they're making is uh, set in Renaissance times, five or six hundred years ago or so. Maybe the guy making the threats uh, wants to stay in character. Surely somebody wandering around the centre of a city full of tourists carrying a bow would be easy to spot. Hmm, not necessarily. Our ballistics people say these aren't really arrows, but crossbow bolts. Apparently, some crossbows can be folded up into something the size of a violin case, or even smaller. 
And have your people managed to get any clues from the notes or the arrows? Nothing at all. No prints and their standard aluminium crossbow bolts, readily available on the internet. Only a crossbow isn't illegal in Italy, so no registration required. We've run the usual checks and we've drawn a blank, so unless the film company can let us have something more concrete, there's not a lot more we can do. I explained that we can't investigate something that hasn't happened, and we don't have the manpower to provide a bodyguard service, but I told her I know somebody who does. And that would be me? That's you, my friend. And you can expect a visit tomorrow morning from a most unusual lady called Rachel Hindenburg, like the famous airship that exploded into flames. She's uh, appropriately named. You'll enjoy meeting her. Just at that moment, the hotel door opened and Signor Dante appeared with the lovely Giuseppina draped all over him. I blurted a quick apology to Virgilio and grabbed my camera. I wasted a few seconds starting the car and switching on the wipers to clear the screen, but the pair of lovebirds were making a meal of it, and I had ample time to shoot off a dozen shots, some in such close-up detail that I could tell the colour of her lipstick all over his face. Finally, they made a run through the rain to his car and drove off. I replaced the camera securely in the bag and glanced in the mirror. Oscar's nose was resting on the top of the back seat, and he gave me a quizzical look. I hastened to reassure him. That's it, dog. We're going home to get something to eat. He licked his lips. I knew how he felt. Neither of us had eaten this evening. That was another discovery I had made recently. Missing meals also came with the turf for people in my new trade. Chapter 1 Tuesday Morning The producer from the film company was scheduled to arrive at 9.30 next morning, so I got into the office early in order to finish writing up the events of last night before emailing an interim copy of the report so far to Signora Dante. I indicated at the end of the email that I would send her the complete report, along with a full series of compromising photos that afternoon, after one final lunchtime photo session at a restaurant where her husband often entertained his lady friend. With that, she should have all the ammunition she needed to file for divorce on the grounds of infidelity. As I waited for my visit from the film producer, I stood and looked out of the window. My office was situated on the first floor of a historic building within Florence's famous Centro Storico, roughly halfway between the main Santa Maria Novella station and the Duomo. I stared down into the courtyard below with its weathered statue of Venus and its medieval fountain. Yesterday's rainstorm had passed and the sun was once more shining from a cloudless sky, making this a very pleasant autumn day. I loved this place. Not just Florence, but my new office. It was so redolent of history, with its high ceilings, the magnificent fresco on the wall, and the ancient terracotta tiles beneath my feet. Since taking on the lease, I had made friends with Nando, who lived on the ground floor and acted as doorkeeper, manager, cleaner and arbiter for the different apartments that occupied the 15th century palazzo. As well as all that, he looked after the interests of the wealthy old aristocratic family who owned the place. He had pointed out all manner of little treasures to me over the past few months, like stained glass windows, iron rings set in the walls for tethering horses, and grooves gouged in the flagstones by the wheels of carriages in centuries gone by. It felt amazing to feel so close to the history of one of the most iconic cities in the world. Even the little picture-framing workshop on the opposite side of the courtyard had been in existence for centuries, and the interior was an Aladdin's cave of ancient tools and apparatus probably designed in the Middle Ages. White-haired Signora Fina, who worked there single-handed, looked as though he'd served his apprenticeship under Michelangelo. Yes, this part of Florence was very different from Osvaldo Dante's concrete love nest. The doorbell rang, and Oscar opened one eye. He wasn't a natural guard dog, and he didn't bother getting up from his bed by the window. I went over to open the door and found myself confronted by an unexpected vision. Standing before me on the 15th century landing was a woman wearing 15th century clothes, complete with a long sweeping robe and a hairstyle that vaguely reminded me of Princess Leia from Star Wars. 
The look was rendered even more startling by the very 21st century bright blue-framed glasses she was wearing and the little lime-green backpack slung over her shoulder. Dan Armstrong? Her accent was soft American, maybe West Coast. Recovering my aplomb, I nodded and held out my hand. Good morning. Yes, I'm Dan Armstrong. Would you be Miss Hindenburg by any chance? To my surprise, she laughed. I certainly would be Rachel Hindenburg. How very English you sound. That's probably because I am English. I stepped back and waved her in. Do come in and make yourself comfortable. Uh, don't mind Oscar. He's very friendly. Probably too friendly. She shook my hand. Hi, Dan. And buongiorno to you, Oscar. Are you a good doggy? Miss Hindenburg swept in and made a beeline for the Labrador, who had worked out by now that our visitor was female, and he'd always liked the ladies. I was not surprised to see him jump to his feet, shake himself gently, and pad across to meet her halfway, tail wagging. She crouched down to make a fuss of him for a few moments, before straightening up and coming to the point. Dan, we need your help. I indicated she should take a seat, and she came over to the desk where I'd been sitting. Whether it was the long dress or some problem with her footwear, she managed to trip just as she reached the desk and fell forward. She only stopped herself from ending up on the floor by throwing herself across the desk, scattering papers everywhere and almost toppling my computer onto the floor. Her head ended up barely a foot or two from my crotch, and I couldn't miss the bright beetroot red flush that spread across her face. It was a pretty face, beneath the blushes, and she had intelligent eyes, what I could see of them, beyond the thick plastic frames of her glasses. She was probably only thirty or so, and I was surprised. I'd always imagined movie producers as being overweight, cigar-smoking sexagenarians with gravelly voices. I'm so sorry. My dress must have caught on something. She pushed herself back onto her feet and slumped down onto a chair. Anyway, like I said, my name's Rachel, and I'm the AP for Lust for Power. Sorry, AP? The acronym was unfamiliar to me. Assistant producer. I report to Mr. Lyons. That's Gabriel Lyons, the producer. She rearranged the neckline of her dress and retrieved the heavy gold necklace that had lodged down her front in the fall. She tugged it out and reattached it with a few words of explanation. Oh, don't worry, it's all fake. She tapped the bejeweled gold chain with her fingers, and I could hear that it, like her glasses, was plastic. The clip's always giving way. I allowed her a moment or two to sort herself out, before giving her a gentle prompt. You were saying that you need my help? Yes, that's why I'm here. You see, we've started getting threatening notes. Yes. Inspector Pisano called me last night and told me. When you say we, do you mean some people in particular, or the production company in general? It's hard to say. The company in general, I suppose. And the threats don't come by mail. I don't know if you've heard from the police, but they come attached to arrows. She looked up and caught my eye. I know. Weird, right? Three of the arrows were found in random places around the lot. But yesterday morning, we found that one had been fired at the door of Miss Gardner's trailer, hard enough to punch a hole right through it. And if that wasn't bad enough, this morning, Mr. Lyons, the producer, found one sticking into the side of his trailer. All of the arrows had notes attached to them, rolled around the shaft and fixed with sticky tape. Do you think Miss Gardner and the producer are being specifically targeted? Like I say, we just don't know. That's what's so worrying. It all seems so random. And what do the notes say? They all say the same. She shrugged off the little backpack and extracted a stiff folder. She handed it across to me, and I saw that it contained small sheets of coarse, cream-coloured paper, all bearing the same wording, written in immaculate calligraphy, Stop filming or start dying. No signature. I had seen a lot of ransom notes and anonymous threats in my time at Scotland Yard, and most had been typewritten, or even old school, made of words cut and pasted from newspapers. Finding threatening notes written by hand was unusual, and written in such formal lettering even more unusual. But then, notes delivered by Arrow weren't exactly commonplace. Whoever was responsible for this wasn't your run-of-the-mill villain. 
How long have you been filming here? Filming? Just under a week. Although we've had people here for almost a month, scouting for locations and getting set up. And how much longer will you be staying? Reckoning on just over a week and a half, more filming? The movie's actually a modern-day thriller set in L.A., and the bits over here are for cutaways. You know, when the director wants to emphasize the similarities between characters or events in the 21st century and things that happened during the Renaissance. The location shooting here in Florence is more a series of cameos, really, so it shouldn't take too long. At the end of next week, the producer, director, and the cast will go back to the States, while a skeleton crew will stay on to wrap things up here. Any idea who might be behind these threats? No idea at all. And the police have seen all of these arrows? All except the one that arrived this morning. But it's exactly the same as the others. The police did a fingerprint check on the others but found nothing. So I imagine this one's the same. They told us there isn't a single print anywhere. Partly that's because they think the perpetrator wore gloves, but also because the notes are written on such coarse paper and fingerprints don't show up on it for some reason. And what about on the arrows themselves? Same again. She reached into her bag once more and pulled out a transparent plastic bag. Inside it, I could see there was an arrow. As she handed it to me, I glanced across at her. Has anybody handled this? I'm afraid so. Everybody from security at the trailer park to Mr. Lyons. So I'm sure you can do what you want with it. Like I say... The police checked the others and said they'd all been wiped clean. I opened the bag and drew out a slim arrow just under a foot long, with rather fancy deep blue flights with bright mustard yellow squiggles on them. I don't have a lot of experience of bows and arrows, but I've seen Robin Hood, and I could immediately see that this was a good deal shorter than your average arrow. It was made of aluminium, as Virgilio had said, and the tip was shiny polished steel with a sharp point. No doubt one of these could do a lot of damage, particularly at close range. Over in the UK, we had long been begging the government to make these subject to the same checks and restrictions as firearms, but to no avail as yet. In the wrong hands, this could well be a deadly weapon. I replaced the arrow in the bag and looked across at the AP. All right if I hang on to this? She nodded, and I tapped the folder containing the notes. And are these all the notes you've received so far? When exactly did they all arrive? The police still have one of the notes, but these are all the others. They first started arriving four days ago. The first was found lying by the entrance to the trailer park. The second was over by Scott Norris's trailer, and the third stuck in the ground. Then there was the one found in Miss Gardner's door yesterday morning, and then the one shot at Mr. Lyon's trailer last night. Did the trailers have the occupants' names on them? Not for the top people, for security reasons. I realized that if these last two arrows had been destined for the star of the show and the producer, this implied inside knowledge. Where are all these trailers? She went on to tell me that the Florence City authorities had allocated the company a private car park for their trucks and trailers, just to the north of the Centro Storico, on the other side of the Viali, the inner ring road that circled the old part of town. In answer to my query, she confirmed that they had two full-time security guards, as well as some local help working for the production company, but that none of them had seen or heard anything. If you have your own people, why do you need me? Jim and Chuck have both come with us from the States. They're good guys, but they're more for crowd control, keeping fans away and so on, than for a proper investigation. And Mr. Lyons insists that we need to get to the bottom of what's going on. Well... If you want me to investigate, I'll be happy to help out, but I'll need access to the set and to all the cast and crew, from the director to the cleaners and bag carriers. She caught my eye and grinned. You mean from the producer to the cleaners and bag carriers, don't you? Mr. Lyons is the big boss. I'm afraid I don't know much about the movie business. What's the difference between the producer and the director? I thought the director was the one who called the shots, like Tarantino or Spielberg. She gave me another little smile. The director has creative control, up to a point, but the producer's the person in overall charge, and Mr. Lyons is a very hands-on producer. He hired the director, and directors can be fired. Her smile broadened. Did you know that the original director of Jaws was fired because he kept on referring to the shark as the whale 
and it drove the producer crazy. <laughs> it does happen. The producer hires all the actors and crew, and above all, the producer raises the money. Without the producer, the movie wouldn't happen. Think about it. At the Academy Awards, when a film wins the Best Movie category, it's the producer, not the director, who goes up to collect the Oscar. We live and learn. Thanks for that. I'll have to read the names of the producers more carefully in future when they roll the credits. Of course, often, the big-name directors have a personal stake in the movie, and so they become producers or associate producers themselves. It's a bit confusing, but as far as lust for power is concerned, Mr. Lyons calls the shots. Right. Thanks for the heads up. I'd better remember that. So if Mr. Lyons is the producer, who's the director? Emiliano Donizetti. Seeing the expression on my face, she provided some explanation. Not heard of him? I'm not surprised. He's a relative newcomer to directing. Italian? Italo-American. He actually lowered her voice, although we were the only people in the room. He used to be Miss Gardner's boyfriend. They broke up a month or two ago and the atmosphere on set can be tense at times. She caught my eye. And um, when I say tense, I mean toxic. I started to read between the lines. I see. So might I be right in thinking that it could have been a matter of love me, love my dog for Selina Gardner? Or, in this case, employ me, but only if you hire my boyfriend as director? Something like that? And then, once he was sure he got the job, he dumped her? She nodded nervously. Yes, I reckon that's about the size of it, from what I've heard, but for God's sake, don't tell anybody I said that. The little smile crept back onto her face. I'd be fired so fast you wouldn't see me for dust. For what it's worth, when you were talking about bag carriers earlier, you were pretty close to the mark. In spite of my grand title, I'm not much more than a gopher. You know, I go for this, I go for that, and I do everything from answering the mail to bringing Mr. Lyons' his coffee. I decided that I rather liked Rachel Hindenburg. I've never been fond of people who are too full of themselves, and I appreciated her almost Anglo-Saxon self-deprecation. I laid out my terms, and she agreed without a murmur, even to my request for my dog to accompany me. Oscar himself, clearly keen to reinforce the request for his presence, had stationed himself alongside her, his head resting on her thigh and his eyes staring lovingly up at her. Like I say, he likes the ladies. And why not? She looked down at him affectionately and stroked his ears. Sure, but just keep him away from Mr. Lyons and keep him off the set. If he wanders out in front of the cameras and spoils the scene, Emmy will go crazy. Emmy being Emiliano, the director. Sounds like an award. Let's hope that his name's a good omen for the success of the film. Come to think of it, having a dog called Oscar around might be a good omen too. By the way, what's the movie about? How come you're filming here in Florence? It's a dual timeline movie. Like I said, it's mostly in 21st century L.A., but with a series of cutaways to Renaissance Florence. Have you heard of the Medici family? Now it was my turn to smile. Heard of them? I studied them for a couple of years. I'm a writer, as well as a P.I., and my first book was set at the time of the Medici. They were legendary. Terrific. You'll have to sit down and talk to Anna. She's our historical consultant. She works at the University of Florence, and she knows everything about the Renaissance. She even designed the dress that I'm wearing. And a very nice dress it is. I gave her another smile. I've been meaning to ask about that. Do you usually go around dressed like this? She gave a resigned nod. While I'm over here, yes, at least when I'm working. It's the idea of our PR guru, Donny Lopez. Everybody has to stay in costume, even offset, so that we get people talking. In fairness to Donnie, he's prepared to put his money where his mouth is, and he wears the same outfit as the rest of the guys. It seems to be working, and it's already aroused a good bit of media attention. She looked up from the dog and rolled her eyes. I don't know how they managed back in the Middle Ages. The trouble with this dress is that the material's so thick it weighs a ton. At least we're in October now, and it's not too warm. But imagine wearing this kind of thing in the height of the summer. If it helps, I believe they didn't wear underwear back then. She raised her eyebrows and smiled. On the subject of clothes, would you mind terribly if we find you a Renaissance costume to wear while you're with us? Danny says we need all the publicity we can generate, and, apart from anything else, it'll make you less conspicuous on set. Besides, 
We need extras for some scenes, so you might find your face in a movie. It's not my face I'm worried about. Five or six hundred years ago, men were wearing tights. I'm not sure the 21st century is ready to see my legs in tights. In particular, any of my former colleagues at Scotland Yard, who would probably do themselves a mischief laughing. You'll be fine. After all, everybody else will be in costume. There'll be no need to feel self-conscious. Hmm, some hopes. Still, if that was what the job demanded, and it promised to be a welcome supplement to my bank balance, I gritted my teeth and said yes. At the AP's request, I scribbled down my chest, waist and leg measurements, and she promised to get wardrobe to look something out for me. I wasn't looking forward to it. We arranged that I would come over to the trailer park a bit later that morning to interview as many of the admin staff as possible, while the majority of the actors and crew were occupied shooting inside the Palazzo Vecchia. After a brief hiatus, while I would zip off to take the last few photos of Signor Dante and his lady friend, I would return to meet up with the rest of the crew, the director, producer and actors in the afternoon, or after filming had finished for the day. Finally, we both stood up, and I gave her my card with my contact details. As she took it from me, she asked me a personal question. Can I ask, how come an Englishman's working as a PI here in Italy? It was a fair question, so I gave her the slightly longer than usual answer. I retired from my job as a detective chief inspector in the Metropolitan Police in London last year. My wife divorced me, so I came over here and stayed on, and I don't regret it for a moment. Tuscany's in my blood now. She nodded in agreement. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Florence has so many wonderful historic buildings, it's hard to know quite where to start. Our location managers have managed to find a number of super picturesque places for the movie. And, as long as the sun keeps shining like it is today, the results should be great. She pulled up a long brocade sleeve and glanced at a very 21st century watch. I have to go. Mr. Lyons will be shouting for me any minute now. She turned towards the door and managed to do that tripping over thing yet again. This time, I was on hand to catch her elbow and steady her, while Oscar looked on with an expression of canine amusement on his face. She was blushing again. Sorry, that's just me. You can probably guess my nickname. Ever since school, people have called me Dizzy, shortened from disaster, after the Hindenburg airship disaster. I'm afraid I've always had a talent for tripping up, bumping into things, knocking stuff over. She shook my hand. You might as well call me that, too. That's what everybody on set calls me. Okay, dizzy it is. Goodbye for now, see you later. She grabbed a hefty handful of her long skirt and set off down the stone stairway. I listened to the sound of her heels waiting for the crash, but she must have managed it without disaster striking. Chapter 2 Tuesday, Mid-Morning The trailer park was crammed with motorhomes and caravans and somebody had erected a screen of two-metre-high wire fence panels all the way around it. When I turned up at the entrance, I was stopped by one of the biggest men I'd ever seen. The word security was emblazoned across his powerful chest in large white letters that stood out against the black background of his T-shirt. Presumably the costume department hadn't been able to find him a medieval outfit his size, although it might have been because there probably hadn't been too many characters around Florence during the Renaissance period with dreadlocks came as no surprise to see that he was wearing dark glasses. I've often wondered why American security guards, federal agents and police officers conduct so much of their business behind dark glasses. As a look, it's intimidating, but from a practical point of view, literally, it must make reading tricky. As I approached, the guard held up a forearm the size of the leg of Tuscan-cured ham I kept in my larder. "'Can I help you, sir?' He spoke in English, making no attempt to speak Italian. He sounded cordial enough, but it would have taken a brave would-be intruder to try to push past him. I'm here to see Rachel Hindenburg. My name's Armstrong, Dan Armstrong. He checked his clipboard and nodded. She's in the trailer, over by those trees. It says production on the door. You have a good day now, sir. I thanked him and made my way across to Dizzy's trailer, passing half a dozen assorted people on the way the women all in long dresses and the men dressed in garish red and yellow striped pantaloons, tunics and red tights. I took one look at them and swallowed hard. Part of a PI's job is to blend in with the surroundings, 
But the idea of wandering around looking like something out of a fairly camp version of Robin Hood didn't appeal in the slightest. When I got to the long static trailer, I tapped on the door. It opened a moment later, and Dizzy beckoned for me and the dog to go in. She gave me an apologetic smile and nodded towards the phone at her ear. I grabbed Oscar's collar to stop him from climbing all over her and went inside. I couldn't help overhearing her end of the conversation, and I was impressed at how businesslike she sounded. A far cry from the clumsy girl who'd almost fallen over twice in my office. Tomorrow morning at the train station, I'll send a car for you. What train are you taking? The 0810 from Rome gets in at 0947? No problem. See you tomorrow. She set the phone down on a table and came over to greet me and my Labrador. As she stroked Oscar, she apologised. Sorry about that, Dan. A journalist from one of the celebrity magazines. Sounds promising. Presumably your PR guy will handle that sort of meeting. Danny, or his PA, Laura Dana. I just make the arrangements and then they get on with it. It's pretty much what I do all the time. Like I told you, I'm a gopher and a fixer. I make things happen for other people. Now, as far as your investigation is concerned, how do you want to play it? I'd quite like to sit down for five minutes with whoever's around here now and ask them a few questions. Presume from what you said that most of the cast and crew are over at the Palazzo Vecchio filming. If you can find me somewhere I can see each of them in turn, that would be great. You can see them in here if you like. Mr. Lyons won't be back for a few hours. Give me five minutes and I'll check who's about and prepare a schedule. Five minutes each, right? Perfect, thanks. Hopefully I'll be able to see all the people who are here this morning before lunch. Like I told you, I'll have to go off on another job for an hour or so at 12.30, but I'll be back around two to carry on. She left me to my own devices while she went off to make the arrangements. I let my eyes range around the surprisingly large interior, which had been set up like a boardroom with a single long table surrounded by half a dozen chairs, all facing a huge monitor at the far end, flanked by a bank of electronic equipment. A smart steel and glass desk, presumably belonging to the producer, stood at the other end, with a separate smaller table alongside it that was obviously Dizzy's workstation. The producer's desk was bare, but Dizzy's was piled high with paper around and on top of a laptop. I wandered over and flicked casually through invoices, receipts, a variety of legal-looking documents on City of Florence-headed paper, and a clipboard with a long to-do list on which I spotted my name. Later entries ranged from Hare Miss G at 5 to Rushes at 6pm. Rushes, if I remembered rightly, referred to scrutiny of the footage shot that day. Presumably the powers that be would sit around this table and take a long, hard look at what had been achieved. Dizzy's voice outside the door interrupted my snooping. Dan, this is Big Jim. I wonder if you can guess why we call him that. You already met him at the gate. The caravan swayed on its blocks as the massive figure of the security guard climbed in. The doorway was a good six inches narrower than his shoulders, so he had to slip in sideways. I asked him to sit down, and I eyed the chair anxiously as he lowered himself onto it. Although it creaked ominously, it held up but I shot off my series of questions as quickly as I could, just in case. I told him I was trying to discover what he knew about the arrows and the threatening notes. The upshot of my questioning was that he knew very little, apart from the fact that whoever had fired arrows at Selina Gardner and the producer's trailers must have either got into the lot by climbing over the security fence or been a good shot to hit them at over 50 yards. I made a mental note to check the range of a crossbow bolt. Big Jim also pointed out that it must have been dark when the arrows were fired, and that would have made it even more unlikely that a perpetrator outside the perimeter fence could have been specifically targeting the two trailers that had been hit. Both events had taken place overnight, when the compound should have been empty, except for a small team of locally sourced security guards from a well-known company in the city. The police had questioned each of them closely, but nobody had seen a thing. Big Jim told me that the crew were distributed around Florence in a selection of hotels, ranging from basic to luxury, depending on where you stood in the pecking order. He gave me a wry smile and indicated that his was one of the more basic hotels. Finally, I asked him if he had any ideas as to who might be behind the threats, and he came up with an observation that gave me food for thought. It's no business of man, but... Chuck and I have both noticed that there's a lot of tension between Mr. Lyons and Emmy. 
as well as between Emmy and Miss Gardner. We even wondered if maybe Emmy might be behind what's going on, you know, just to piss one or the other off. An expression of apprehension crossed his face. But don't you go telling people I said that.